Well, welcome everyone. It's another Friday and you're back. Uh, it's going to be about 219 days, just a little over 31 weeks until USC kicks off in Las Vegas uh, against the LSU Tigers. And you're here again every week for the only USC caller-driven interactive call-in show that's pretty much directed by you guys. We're going to put forth some ideas and some topics, but you absolutely do not have to follow them. That is the procedure here. This show is about you guys. It's a chance for the Trojan family to sound off or college community to sound off and let us know what you think about what the Trojans are doing. Uh, this week, the title really is, is the fact that this defensive, uh, the new defensive staff has hit the ground running for recruiting. They're out there in the SEC territory trying to get some of the bigger linemen that we've missed in the past. Uh, we got uh, Coach Eric Henderson. We'll talk about him pretty soon. But uh, Matt, how are you doing this week? Choir. Great having you aboard at Trojans Wire. And so, uh, you know, not the most explosive of weeks, but of course there has been some Big Ten news that we're going to discuss later in the show. So, you know, there are some things definitely to talk about, um, but uh, great to be back here on the Conquest Collins Show. We got one call, perfect timing. We got one call right outside the shoot. Uh, caller, thank you for starting us off. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Manjeet from Imperial, California. What's going on, fellas? Well, happy Friday, Manjeet. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Do doing great. Like I said, it's Friday. Let's do this. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I just heard you guys, your, your opening monologue, you're talking about recruiting. Um, I, I think we did decent, but there's 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 a lot of players that we left off the table that they, they could have gone after. But the one guy I do want now that Harbaugh's gone, that fifth five, he's from our backyard. We gotta we gotta get, make that happen. And go and get that guy. There's no reason we can't get him. Well, Mason Graham, you're talking about, and Matt and I were just talking off um, offline about is there any news on Minter? Is there any news on Minter? Because I'll tell you what, you know, you got a guy who's who's. I mean, he's a big man on campus, right? You're just coming off from national championship. The culture there is still in place. It looks like this recent news is that Sharon Moore is going to be retained or actually elevated to head coach. So a lot of that has culture, been. he has been. Yeah, it was on Nash Schefter. It's, it's official now. So um, yep. it's it's official. So there's going to be some continuity. Uh, usually we have an outside change. That's where you see this wholesale everybody leaving. But at least on the offensive side of the ball, it probably should stay in place. Uh, where there is question is, is a lot of people are saying that um, uh, Jesse Minter, the defensive coordinator, may follow Jim Harbaugh to the Chargers. And because it's like you said, that's, Mason, yeah, that's you want, what I've heard. Yeah, you want Mason to come, and that might be one reason why he would. Uh, so uh, I hope they do. I hope they throw a lot of money in him because, man, he would be a wrecking force in the middle for USC, make a big difference in, in the year yeah, one of the Eric Henderson. Yeah, before I, before I hang one, one, one more comment. Look at Ohio State, man. How do they get in all those guys? You, I, I, I keep bringing that up, but you gotta play that game, NLI game. If not, it is. It, it, everything is 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 useless. You gotta get get those guys, man. Ohio State, they, they're all in. You gotta break out the bag and go get those the studs. Yeah. Well, there's um again, there's what is what the NIL was supposed to be, and it's what some programs are doing with it. Uh, Talked about this, I think, on Monday with Mark. The fact that you know Ohio State has a new athletic director coming from um, from Texas A and M, and you remember their game plan. So I don't think they plan on slowing down. Obviously, we've seen what Oregon's done done for the past I don't know how long, even before NIL started, as far as giving lots of um, options for people coming to their school. So I I think that you will see USC join. Uh, there was a great interview. If you guys haven't seen it. Uh, Ryan Abraham had a great interview with Jen Cohen today, which was a just phenomenal job getting her number one. But then uh, just having her speak candidly uh, uh, quite a bit about NIL. So I highly suggest you guys checking that out as well. Matt, your thoughts on uh, yeah, Ohio yeah. State so killing it? Well, you know, if you caught my show with uh, Tim and Mark Rogers on Monday, you know, I made the point. Let, let's be honest here. And, all, and, and you know, first off, Credit Ohio State for making the investment. Like, I'm not trying to be an Ohio State hater here. Ohio State's investing. And when you invest, you know, you give yourself a better chance of getting results. So credit to Ohio State. But on, but in the same vein, let's be honest here. Real talk. It's not as though recruits are just dying to play for Ryan Day. Come on. Like, like 
They're not saying, oh, th oh this oh, is my path to get a bell. I know, I know what's what? going on, brother. I know they got the but We have the same thing, though. Level the playing field. Well, yeah, but my point is, is that recruits are not going to Ohio State because they they just are enamored of Ryan Day. They're they're not dying to play for Ryan Day. You know, he's gotten his butt. Hold on, he's gotten his butt kicked by Jim Harbaugh the last few years. So it's not about the coach; it's about the investment that Ohio State is making. So I I am agreeing with your point that it, Jen and Jen Cohen needs to be working her her those fundraising channels. Behind the scenes, she needs to get a more robust pipeline going. And USC is is just getting walloped. And, you know, Lincoln Riley is a better coach than Ryan Day will ever hope to be. And yet it's not manifesting itself in terms of player acquisition and player transactions. So, like, that, that has to be a five-alarm uh, fire, uh, you know, warning shot for Jen Cohen that her fundraising prowess really needs to kick into high gear uh, if this NIL operation is going to be legitimately competitive. And it's the same thing with Oregon. Like, I think Lincoln Riley's a better coach than Dan Lanning, but when the other teams and the, and the other coaches are getting better players, you know, the, the, the coaching comparison can only go so far. And, of course, Lincoln Riley set back the program by not firing Alex Grinch. It's not as though uh, – I mean, a year ago, uh, and it's not as though we can undo that. I mean, we, this was a wasted year of our lives, but he finally got religion. He finally got wise and uh, found the right defensive coaching staff. And now that that's in place, boy, the NIL uh, part of it needs to be uh, in line with the quality of the coaching and the quality of the program that Lincoln Riley has created at USC. Exactly. So uh, let, let me just kind of close this out with one last point. I agree with everything you, you just said. But you can go get Pete Carroll, Bill Belichick, Nick Saban on the same staff. But if you can't get him the players, brother, nothing's going to happen. I was, I was like about to throw out when Oregon kicked our ass and Notre Dame. That can't happen, man. Come on. Yep. It'll be interesting to see if they get the same turned around. Again, uh, the, during that interview on 247, uh, Jen Cohen said that the fundraiser is going extremely well. Um, I saw, who was it? Someone said they weren't happy with her answers. Um, was it was Russ. I think it was Russ. Yeah. Russ. yeah Russ said, you know, he's not happy with her answers. You guys, there is a way that NIL is supposed to be done. And, um, you know, it, it it's gonna, there's going to be some more clarification. She did say in an interview that there's, there's going to be clarification on, you know, uh, what, is permissible what isn't usc is not willing to push the envelope and jump across and start you know doing stuff that might come back to haunt them like some of these other schools may find out later on because there are guidelines and some and these guys are pushing the boundaries of that and there may be some ramifications down the road for them but uh you know one of the things she did say is the new uh -huh. rules the new rules did say that there's going to be more room for coaches and the coaching staff to actually engage in the conversations with the nil so that everybody's on the same page, which you know hasn't been you know a, a permissible uh, yet to this point. Well, thanks again, Manji. You're, you've been a great support right. of the show. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you next weekend. Hey, all right. Can I can I ask one, one last question, brother? One Re last question. Really quick. Do you think Julian Lewis is that going to stick, or somebody else going to come with a bigger bag and he's going to be gone? All things point to he's staying. I don't think the bag itself is the biggest thing for him. I think development, his family has been very secure and very clear about that. But you know what? It's it's still a whole year and, and it's recruiting. So you never know what could happen. It's too, too far away to know that. All one. right, fellas. God bless. Yeah. God bless you guys. Thank you. Uh, I'll listen to the show. All right. Great call. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye. Yeah, I mean... Who knows what? Who knows what's going to be up in, in December? But the good news was is that uh, not only is he going to he reclassified, but also we got the news that he's going to be an, an early admit. So that's, that's one more thing to look at. Hello, call. You're on with Tim and Matt. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is uh, Gary from Dana Point. Good to see you guys. Yeah, uh, good to see you, Gary. I, we'll give you the. Hey, thank you. I. Uh, Love you guys and loved your input and everything else. I want to give you the thesis statement of what I was trying to get to is the, the effectiveness of coaching and what that can do for our team. And let me just set it up really quickly. One, we are getting our rear ends handed to us on NIL, and that's just the way it is right now. We're not going to be a top five recruiting class. 
We're not going to be a top five portal class. Pretty much what we have is what we got. Now, we may get a few people here and there, but what do we have? Well, we got a good quarterback, great running back. And Tim, I'm sure your optimism about the offensive line. Uh, the defensive line, I'm not sure about. Linebackers, I'm not sure about. Our secondary is going to be fine. But we've got what we've got. It pretty much. Now, here I'm going to give an illustration, and then I'll leave it to you guys to tell me because I'm 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 really asking about what we can expect the coaches to do for us. I coached a uh, low-level team of 14 and 15 year olds. I was the defensive coordinator, and I told my defensive end, I don't care if they go inside you and score 100 touchdowns, but don't you ever let anybody go outside. And I told my safeties, I don't care if they catch 50 passes in front of you, but don't ever, ever let anybody go deep. And at that level of football, you know, those four points on either side of the line and the, and the safeties is where everybody was scoring a point. We went undefeated, and we had the best defense in the entire league, won the championship, and I'm a nothing coach. But the point is I got all kinds of compliments from the other coaches saying, Wow, what a well-coached defense. And we weren't that talented. So here's my question. I think what we got on the roster, we got. But I'm taking my cue from you guys because I don't know these new coaches. But can they? Can coaching deliver the difference? Because last year, prior to the season, I heard a lot of guys in the voice of college football saying, oh, we're going to go 12-0, and we're going to go 11-1. and I even thought they were going to go 10-2, and so I got myself you know, taken to the woodshed there. But can these guys take what we've got in the, in the old soup kettle here and make it happen for us? Yeah. Matt, Gary, uh, you know, great, great set of questions. And I, I'm going to reiterate my point that the most important assistant on this staff in 2024 is Josh Henson. And that's not, that shouldn't be implied as a negative verdict, but it is kind of a, this is a prove it season for Josh Henson because 2022 was great. He did a great job mixing and matching with that offensive line. But of course it helped that Bobby Haskins was a home run in the transfer portal and USC swung and missed in the portal in 2023 with Tarquin, Kingston, uh, Pregnon, like none of them were home run hitters. Uh, for USC and Tarquin was especially disappointing. We remember the Notre Dame game and, and how much of a bust that was. Uh, so, so here we are of 2024 and Tim's been talking about the young guys ready to step up, make a name for themselves. And if Josh Henson maximizes these young talents up front, then you, USC is in a great situation long term because the defensive side of the ball you look at all these coaches, just like I'm, I'm already sold. Like, and, and it's just, you know, what, what USC uh, gains through, through discarding Alex Grinch and Dante Williams, that's, you know, like that's a big gain in and of itself. And then you get the big gain of retaining Taylor Mays. And I haven't heard anything official, but like he hasn't left. So that's good news. No news is good news with Taylor Mays. He hasn't uh, gotten an offer for anywhere else. So, like that increases the chances that he's going to remain on this staff. And that's huge, assuming that he stays, that he sticks. And then you have the incoming guys, Dan, Danton Lynn, Matt Ants, Doug Belk. And Gary, your, your question about the coaching, it also brings up the point. This week was a very, very good week for USC in terms of retaining Danton Lynn. You know, that, the, that flight risk to the Baltimore Ravens, it's not zero, but it went down. Because with the Falcons hiring Raheem Morris, with the Panthers uh, hiring uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offensive coordinator. So like Pete Carroll, Bill Belichick haven't latched onto a team. Vrabel hasn't latched onto a team. Ben Johnson hasn't latched onto a team. So the number of vacancies with the number of uh, high profile candidates, the chances of Mike McDonald leaving the Ravens to take a head coaching job. Again, they're not zero, but they definitely went down significantly and so if mcdonald stays put with the ravens and john harbaugh that means danton lynn has no flight risk uh at, at usc so the odds of a danton lynn move to baltimore went way down this week that's very good for usc and so you have this defensive staff in place you know that's going to add so much quality 
to this team, but Josh Henson remains the assistant coach who really has to nail it down in 2024. Yeah, and by the way, I, I you just said fundamentals of don't of don't let people get behind you, and you know set those edge right. Don't let them get outside you on the line. I think that you're going to be happy. We're going to look at a different scheme. Our corners are, I believe, I don't know if that will, but are not going to be sitting out on islands like they were last year. Uh, and I do think with Sean Nua and Eric Henderson teaching fundamentals, I think that's going to help a lot. And you know, we'll see Danton Lynn's uh, scheme. I don't think we're going to see guys going right and left on us like they did last year. So do I know? I absolutely don't know. I said a little, what I say, I think I said, I think I said, I didn't want to say what I said last year. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say that uh, let's, let's see what we do in the spring. I think we still need a couple pieces inside defensively. If we get those, I'm going to feel a lot better. And then we start making predictions. Thanks Gary. Thanks for calling again. We can always count on a great call from you. Well, I love you guys, and thanks a lot for the insight. It really it means a great deal to me, so fight on. Fight on, Gary. <sighs> yeah. Uh, I'm not, I, I've am not. i learned two years in a row not to run and shoot my mouth off like I've done two years in a row. I'm going to need to see a lot more before I start making huge, bold predictions this year. Good evening. Thank you for calling. You've reached uh, Matt, who's sitting here ready for your call. Uh, what's your name? And... Uh, where are you from? I mean, I couldn't have it any type of way. It's up on a Friday. It's Avery, Avery, Avery. What's going on, family? How you doing today? What's up, Avery? How's Georgia treating you? How you doing? Seeing any uh, SE coaches crew? Virginia working, so. I, 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 I'm, try, I'm trying to do, uh, I'm going to keep this to myself and point up. I'm trying to make some, 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 some changes for us so we can get a family member on board, but that's neither here or there. <laughs> okay. How you doing today? We're good. What's on your mind? Uh, what if I wanted to pivot from 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 today? Because my last call was after the Louisville game, and I gave my diatribe off my soapbox. But I don't know if you remember. I said all we need to do is um, go to the grocery store so we can get the groceries and load the pantry up. So I'm I'm I don't know about anybody else, but I'm pretty convinced with the coaching staff, like. If I had the red eye coaches that right now, I definitely believe they're top five. Um, they just need the time to develop, uh, do the things that they need to do, and, and let them work. I mean, Matt already alluded to. Unfortunately, Lincoln should have made this decision a year ago, but at this point, you can't cry about Stillman. All you can do is get the paper tire out, make it better, and proceed forward. What I want to say is I think the biggest hire in the last six months to a year has been Jen Cohen. And I think one of the reasons that I say that is this same time last year, she wasn't in place. And I don't think there was anybody on the administrative staff that sat down with Lincoln to gauge his thought process and get him in the right direction to make sure that we wouldn't be here today. So I honestly think with her being hired, I think that she's going to be able to kind of bring Lincoln back to his senses and lead him in the right direction. And then this is really for, for, for the two of you. Um, I think Lincoln gets in his own way sometimes. And you say, well, what makes you say that? He didn't know Miller Moss was going to be as good as he's going to be. He really thought that Will Howard is better than, than Miller Moss. So that's where I feel like sometimes Lincoln kind of outthinks some things, and I honestly believe that Jen Cohen is the yin to his yang. And I alluded to earlier last year when I was calling on the show that Lincoln doesn't need yes men around him. He needs people that are going to, they're going to be real with him. They're going to, they're going to rattle his cage sometimes, but make him, make him think outside of his comfort zone. And I honestly believe that Jan Cohen is probably the, the biggest hire that we've had in a long time to kind of steer him in the right direction to make sure that he doesn't make uh, decisions like he made last year to hold on to Alex Wentz. What do you say? Well, Avery, I, I would say that maybe – so you got to remember the timeline a little differently. I think maybe he thought he'd be able to get both. Keep, you know, keep um, – I thought he'd be able to. I thought he thought he'd be able to keep all the quarterbacks in place. I thought he'd be. I thought didn't expect losing Malachi Nelson. I thought that he would bring in. Um, I mean, I can, so bottom line is, is it happened. Miller had that game and it changed the trajectory. We don't know how much that affected Will, but you know he he obviously decided that that he was not coming to SC. I don't know if he was set on it. If you're a, if you're a coach, you want to have as many options as possible. You know what I mean? And I, I think he knew what he had with Miller, but. I don't think he knew when Miller came out and had that game. I don't think that, you know, that 
he expected him after having one full week of practice to come out and play like that against a very good Louisville uh, uh, defense. I guess that's the best way to say it. I, I don't think I think sometimes fans think that coaches are perfect and see the future. Things are dynamic and they change, and we don't know exactly what happened. You know, we don't know what Will Howard was thinking. So, uh, Matt, your thoughts on on Will Howard's uh, change over to Ohio State? I I don't think this is particularly complicated. I mean, we don't know exactly what happened, but like Will Howard visited USC, <laughs> and but he didn't commit. So <laughs> that tells me. Lincoln Riley and Will Howard had a conversation saying, hey, let's wait until after the Holiday Bowl. Then we'll see where we are. The Holiday Bowl happened. Boom. Choice was pretty easy. Like, I, I don't think it's this amazing puzzle, you know, like a like a Hercule Poirot uh, mystery or anything like that. Like, I think just they played the waiting game. Let's see what happens in the Holiday Bowl. We all saw what happened. Two plus two equals four. Yeah. Great, great, great point, uh, Avery. Thank you so much for calling, man. Hey, glad to talk to you guys. Fight on. Continue your, your success on the show. Thanks. Fight on, Avery. Yeah, we may shout never know. To, shout out to Gary from Dana Point for that $20 super sticker. Thank you so much, Gary. We really appreciate you. Yeah, Gary. Thank you. Well, we, we do. Yeah, we got more calls. Hello, thank you for calling. First off, yeah, thank you for being here. Second, thank you for calling. You're on with Tim and Matt. Um, what's your name? Where are you calling from? My name is Augie Garcia, and I'm calling from Oxnard, California. Augie, okay, what's Hello? on your mind? Yeah, hi, what's on your mind? Uh, well, I to take you back to the coaching aspect. Um, I think we, I played with little with more uh with Vic Kusha at LA Wilson. We were city champs four years straight back in the seventies. And we weren't top uh four stars, division one players. We were just a team. And uh Coach Kusha, Don Ron and Steve Clarkson who followed afterwards. We were just uh, a well coached team and with all that said, coaching makes a difference. Yeah, with Without a doubt, I think we kind of saw a little bit of that on the defensive side of the ball last year, right? Well, actually, you can see coaching does make a difference. We saw what the offense did for two years, um, you know, with with missing parts, missing pieces, with injuries towards the end of last year. Uh, sorry, uh, the 22 season, you saw what good coaching did. I mean, there's no reason that USC should have still had a chance in that fourth quarter with their quarterback on one leg. They're 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 missing their their center and their and their left uh, and their left guard or left tackle. And yet we're still in that game. That was all coaching. And on the flip side of that last year in 2023, I think we did have some very talented players, but they just weren't coached up and they weren't put in a position to win. And we saw what happened last year. Matt, coaching? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I just, I, I think the, the, the drum that I keep banging is that Lincoln Riley wasted a year of his career, of our lives, of the USC program and everything else by not making these kinds of changes earlier. And just a brief aside on all of this, you know, this is the voice of college football, not the voice of college basketball. But like everything that we've been talking about with USC football, it reinforces the idea that Andy Anfield needs to be fired. And some people might think that that's a, a harsh verdict, but I'm just make the point that you don't have to settle for second best. You don't have to settle for okay. USC should be striving for greatness, for excellence. And Andy Anfield is good. Like he made a bunch of NCAA tournaments, but just because you're good, like that doesn't mean you settle on that. You should be striving for greatness. And Lincoln Riley settled for, you know, okay, you know, if, if that with Alex Grinch, and he finally realized, you know what? No, I need, I need excellence everywhere on my staff. Like I can't afford to have coaches who fall short of, you know, a very high bar in terms of coaching technique, in terms of player development. And it's, you know, it's a shame that he had, he had, we had to suffer through the 2023 season for Lincoln Riley to learn that, but at least he learned it. And at least he burned only one season. Like if this didn't drag on for two or three years, what a disaster that would have been. So one year was wasted, but but now he has pieces in place. And I reiterate that with Taylor Mays staying, you know, I, I, I we we ha we have to remember 
just how good that secondary looked in the Holiday Bowl in terms of tackling, in terms of knowing where to be. That was Taylor Mays. Taylor Mays did that. He did the thing. And so with Taylor Mays staying, uh, that's just absolutely huge. And that, at that point can't be emphasized enough in terms of how much better this defensive uh, coaching staff is going to be relative to last year. Who's there? No. Yeah, are there any particular um, moves on on the coaching that you that you're looking forward to this year? There are quite a few to choose from. Well, I believe the everything's moving forward. Uh, all good. We can't look back in the uh, rearview mirror. We just got to press on and fight on, and uh, the best is uh, yet to come. And looking forward to uh, an awesome new year. Absolutely. And a lot to look forward to, you know, joining the, the join the big 10. Uh, again, like I said, we're, we're facing off to starting that first game in, in Las Vegas against LSU. It's going to be, it's going to be, we can't promise a great year, but it's definitely gonna be an entertaining year and a very fun year full of storylines, just facing all the new conference and, and this really rough schedule. But Augie really appreciate your call. I uh, hope you make it become a regular caller. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. And fight on. Yes, sir. It's one team and believe in the dream. Simple. All right. Yep. That, that's the kind that's the kind of uh energy we're gonna need. Cause I think, you know, at some point during the year, there's gonna be a lot of people questioning. I wanna say we're gonna go, you know, twelve and zero. I wanna say we're going eleven to one, but with this schedule and the bringing in a new, you know, Lynn was able to turn around really fast at UCLA. There's no guarantee that's going to happen here. There's going to be a lot of moving parts, new people moving in, people learning a new system. Offensive line, I think, is going to be very talented. But I think, again, they don't have a lot of time playing together. It'll be interesting what we see early because I think that it's going to be tested early. Two of our first three games, you know, we start with LSU, and I believe the third game of the season, so fourth game, is going to be uh, in Michigan, in Ann Arbor against Michigan. So, it's going to be a really quick wake-up call for these Trojans. Hopefully, they can answer the bell. Well, Matt, I don't know why, because I was pretty fast with the phone calls tonight. Uh, we did lose four calls. Oh, maybe they're calling back. Here we go. There's one. <laughs> there we go. Uh, good evening. Thank you for calling in. You're on with Matt and Tim. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, guys. It's Dave from Iowa. Dave, how you doing? Good, good, good. All right, so I'll get right into it. I got two questions, and it's it, – one, it's about a – but, you know, in terms of just regular college football, a potential coaching staff – um, a, another coaching uh, job for uh, for other coaches, but as well as from their perspective. So first question is, so back in 2018 when Herm Edwards was coaching ASU, he had the former – or, at, you know, at the time the former Bengals head coach be his personal assistant for those kind of – game time decisions, whether two point conversions, onside kick, regular kickoff, all that stuff. Do you think in today's world, the, um, the, the entire college football world could, we, we could potentially see that since we are seeing head coaches make questionable decisions, so to speak, from the fans perspective. And second, in terms of coaching, what is the mindset of making adjustments at halftime rather than making adjustments, you know, during the quarters or, you know, you know, like, like, because the reason what I'm getting at is just, you know, re, you know, in terms of making those adjustments, rather than being behind 14 points and then coming back and tying up the game, you could have just made those adjustments earlier, so to speak. And then, you know, you know, the game would shape up differently in the second half. So I'm just curious if you think like that's just coaches being arrogant or if there's potential some psychology to it of the fact that like, the players may feel that, oh, shoot, we're already going to plan C and we're, we're, we're midway through the second quarter. And, you know, could they lose faith? What are your thoughts? Well, they're making adjustments between between series. If you watch, if you ever watch the sideline NFL college high school, there there are their position coaches. There, there are, uh, you know, people talking to them and they are making small adjustments. They are pointing certain things out to because you're going to see film, but Obviously, the other team knows that, and they're going to throw some new wrinkles at you. They're going to come at you, probably see some weaknesses. They're going to try to scheme some things to happen. So throughout the game, they are making adjustments. Just the big phrase is that halftime adjustment is when you can really see what they're doing, pull the whole team together, and have time to, to discuss. 
but they're they're making adjustments the entire time. Matt, your thoughts? Dave, very interesting question because you know last season, we, let's remember the first half of the schedule, the first several games were the soft underbelly of the schedule, and then the the, the tough games were all from mid October onward. And USC did terribly, of course, but. You know, the rationale for the way lineups and rosters uh, rotations were managed in September was that, you know, hey, we're going to have these tough games. We need to keep guys fresh. We need to rotate players in and out. Um, so, like, there was a particular reason for, for the coaching staff using certain player rotations uh, in September. That doesn't apply this year with, with LSU and then Michigan – uh, in the first few games of the season. USC won't have the luxury of just kind of being able to experiment, almost treating games like a preseason game, won't have that chance. So like uh, you, the coaching staff will have to make more adjustments on the fly early in a game if it sees that certain matchups uh, aren't working. So, so that's an interesting point there. Your other point, if I, was a, if I was a college head coach, I would certainly have a game management specialist and i would sit him down before the season i would have like a game management seminar with my players in terms of knowing time and score you know when to run out of bounds when to take a knee at the one yard line etc 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 you know i would i would definitely have like a game management analyst you know who's on you know, like that's not one of the on-field positions, you know, since you're limited there, like a special teams coordinator, USC doesn't have one of those. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't burn one of my on-field assistant positions for that. But on my staff, you know, if I have an offensive analyst, I would have a game management analyst to lock some things in with my players, make sure their football IQ is high, make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of a philosophy of how we approach various uh, situations so that the head coach doesn't have to think about it so that it's it's pretty much uh, ingrained and, and decisions are ready to go. You know, one thing we see from a lot of coaches is, you know, they'll hem and haw about what decision to make. They'll burn a timeout. You know, they'll they'll send on the punt team or maybe the field goal team. Then they'll call a timeout. They'll rethink it and then they'll go for it on the other side of the timeout. If you know how you want to play and you've mapped out various situations, you don't have to burn timeouts. So I would certainly use an analyst position for game management, One, but like I don't see that happening across the sport. Well, I'm, I'm waiting to see when that, uh, that uh, trend is really gonna pick up some momentum because like, yeah, coaches do not get it. We, we see so many wayward decisions, like Dan Lanning, you know, as, as chewing field goals on fourth and four, like fourth and one, that's one thing. But fourth mm -hmm. and four, you know, take three points early in the game. You need to have a philosophy of not just, you know, being aggressive, but also know when to take points, know when to, you know, hedge your bets a little bit. And and we see coaches making so many uh, mistakes, like Sean McVay punting late in that uh, wild card game against the Lions when he had only one timeout left. Like this is a Super Bowl champion head coach, and he's a young head coach. But like he's still making the kind of play that Kirk Ferentz at Iowa would make. So like these guys still have a lot of work to do, and uh, it does show that game management, coaching acumen, it's still not up to standard uh, across the industry, pro as well as college. Gotcha, gotcha. I completely understand where you're coming from. Uh, one one quick question since we since I I introduced the topic of, you know, the details of game management or whatever. If it's under two minutes to go and your team and, and, and let's just say USC has the ball, we're on offense. We got to, you know, we got to score a touchdown to take the lead. Um, would you rather have USC like just score, score, you know, not ASAP, but, you know, score as fast as possible kind of deal and then have the opposing team, you know, re really get that pressure of like, okay, it's up to the offense to actually get a touchdown kind of deal. Because in my mind, in today's world, both in the NFL and college, especially with the new rules or whatever, you know, these coaches are just, you know, draining out the clock, which in the moment it makes sense. But I find it, you know, honestly, 70% of the time, 70% of the time when, when you're, when you, when you're the coach and you're that coach, you're on offense and you're draining the clock or whatever, 70% of the time, it kind of bites you in the ass. What do you think? 
Well, you know, it's all very contextual and situational, Dave, right? Because, you know, with, with an Alex Grinch coach defense, you need to whittle down as much clock as possible. You need to make sure you're scoring with under 20 seconds left. Because, like, even Bryson Barnes was able to drive the ball down the field for a winning score late against USC this past season. But now if you're playing the Iowa Hawkeyes offense, you shouldn't really worry too much about uh, leaving time on the clock. You just score. Score against a good Iowa defense, and like your, your defense should be able to stop uh, whatever pathetic Iowa quarterback uh, gets the ball. So it's all contextual. You know, if your defense is really bad or Tom Brady is on the other team, yes, you, sh you should. Like, let's remember Bill's Chiefs, you know, 13 seconds for the Chiefs. Like, the Bills actually did a decent job of scoring late, and they st it still didn't work <laughs> in that uh, playoff game. So it's really all very contextual. But, but like, good coaching, you will, you will have your players prepared before a game saying, okay, this is the caliber of opponent we're facing. You know, these are our strengths. These are our weaknesses. This is how we want to play the game. This is how we want to deal with an end game situation when we're on offense, when we're on defense. Like coaches need to be have that all mapped out beforehand. And I don't get the sense that that's true predominantly in the industry. And remember, a lot of people you hear it all the time when it's down by the goal line. People say, "Oh, you should have taken a knee at the one yard line, or they should have gone down there and not scored and you know burned some more time off the clock." How many times have you seen? a team inside the five and now all of a sudden you got a false start and now it's and now it's third and nine from the six a third third and six you know third and goal from the six instead of being knocking on the door to score or god forbid a holding call you know all all kinds of things can happen and, and a lot of them not good a fumbled snap we remember we saw the end think about the end um of the Arizona game last year all we we're trying to do is just hand the ball off it couldn't even get that accomplished that it was dropped onto the ground and almost turned the ball over there. I mean, the way they mismanaged the very end of that game, trying to be cute, uh, that almost cost them the game last year. So I, I'm with Matt. You score, especially the, the other portion of that, Mark, Matt, is it also depends on the defense you're playing, right? I mean, if you're playing a tough defense, you get the ball in for that six because you don't know if you may get a chance to get it in for six. I'm not saying you score right away. I'm saying you score right away if, if the opposing offense sucks. It should be situational. That's my thing. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm on the side as you score when you score because there are just too many things that go wrong on offense uh, to to start messing around. If you're if you need a touchdown, you need to get in the end zone. You just got to score that touchdown. And hopefully this year we have a defense that we don't have to worry about, right? Where we're just that, that, a yeah. given, like Matt well, said. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully. hopefully. Yeah, Dave, appreciate you calling as always. It's a great support of the show. Um, great, great questions and comments as always. Uh, sorry, guys, you're kind of breaking up there, but hey, fight on. Thank you, for, thank you for letting me call. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks for calling in. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, listen, Matt, I only missed four calls tonight, and uh, the average call was, time was only six minutes. Uh, we didn't really get into a lot of it. Was there anything we didn't talk about that you want to talk about before we get out of here? Because uh, yes, yes. So nice. Alex Grinch. Alex Grinch is going to be coaching in the Los Angeles Coliseum in <laughs> 2024 against USC. And we, I'm licking my chops. I don't know about you, Tim. I'm licking my chops. Miller Moss, Lincoln Riley against an Alex Grinch secondary. Uh, I'm I'm notching that up as a USC W over UW. Or, well, or now UW, remember, rather. he's not the defensive coordinator. He's just the safeties coach. But you know, you know maybe maybe that's his niche. You know, niche. Maybe, maybe he's going to be happier there. Now, here's a bigger question. I was on the Light the Torch. I was in the I was in the chat, the Light the Torch podcast. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about that fact that how loud are they going to boo out? Now, I'm going to be on record saying that I wasn't happy with the way the, the defense has fared, but I, I I really would hope that USC fans have a little more class. Uh, and it's not like the guy was losing on purpose and have a little more class than sit there and boo a man. Uh, but you know what's going to happen. So the question is going to be, who's going to get the louder boo? Is it going to be Alex Grinch when he comes out as a safeties coach? 
right? Or the next year when uh, when we have, uh, you know, Clay Helton's coming to the Coliseum. Who's going to get the louder boo? Clay Helton or Alex Grinch um, in 24 and then in 25? So that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting to see. Hopefully, again, for the fans, we show a little more class and a little more restraint. And we, uh, <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't light the roof off with, uh, with a bunch of booing. But like, you know, Lincoln Riley knows what Alex Grinch's tendencies are and Lincoln Riley knows what Tackett Curtis's tendencies are. Like, I, I, I just smell USC exploiting that Wisconsin Swiss cheese defense on September 28th. Yeah, well, I, I think that you are right. I, I, I think USC uh, will have that game. Well, everybody's games, right? Everybody's game. But I think that the home game. This, the is, this is a, this like that that game. The spice quotient just went way up for that one. I think that the media are going to have more fun with that than the actual fans on game day. But we we will we will see. We absolutely will see. Uh, just really quick notes. Also, you guys that the USC is out there recruiting. Um, they were able to go into uh, go into uh, the South uh, and grab. A Texas commit now that he hasn't he's not flipping, and I'm not saying he's gonna flip, but the instant impact that we're having at Eric um, Henderson having is now you have uh, our coaches going out into the living rooms, and kids are now although we, Texas commit he has decided to come out and visit USC. So this is the instant impact that this this uh, recruiting uh, the recruiting chops. We were talking about we're worried about Eric being able to go out there and into and what kind of recruits could be. His elected personality, his use of social media shows us that he's going to be someone special out there. So um, get ready for that. Also, this weekend, Junior Day, uh, we can go into that list really quick in a moment, but we got our call. Let's see, grab this call real quick, Matt. Yep. Hello, you're on with Matt and Tim. What's your yep. name? Where are you calling from? Oh, my name is Keith calling from Irvine. Keith, thanks for calling. What do you want to talk about? Yes. Oh, I'm on live. I was just watching you guys on YouTube, and I and I called in. What's up, guys? Yep, you are what's live. Down? What's up? My, my what's, boy, what's your question? My boy, my boy is, hey, first of all, I want to let you guys know that this show is one of my favorite shows of all time. Um, and I wish I could call in more. Sometimes I'm just, you know, listening to you guys while while you know, I'm getting yelled at by the wife. You know, one AirPod in the, in the air. You know, another ear uh, on on listening to her talk, talking to me to clean up. But uh. My question is this, man, and I, and I truly want to know, you know, what do you guys think about the running back room? Uh, because I think we got some young guys. We got B-Jack coming in. Uh, but, you know, it was I, I was very interested when we brought in the kid from Mississippi State because, you know, I feel like we got enough, enough running backs. Uh, and I know that would only put us at three, but – I don't. I don't want you know Amari and Adrian to you know get get their carries taken away by some older guy. So I want to hear what you guys think about the running backs. Uh, thank you guys for everything you guys do. Great show. One of my favorite of all time. Fight on. Fight on. Well, um, running backs. You can never have them. Uh, you can never have too many because they get banged up and it's a long year. And one more added thing you got to think about is is going into the Big Ten. There's if there's physicals, they tell us they are. Uh, there's going to be a lot of hard yards that are going to be earned, and you want you know healthy running backs going those games. I I've been a you know a huge fan of of um, Quinn and Joiner since the, since the spring game. Um, Amarian Peterson also you had a pretty interesting spring game as well. That's just a spring game, so you can't put too much into that. But they are two great young running backs from Texas. USC has done very good with Texas running backs over the years, and there are just two more coming in. Uh, is it Jaquavius Marks? I think is a kid from Mississippi State. You know, you're adding yeah. that. You're adding that experience. You know, you're adding just an extra set of legs. Uh, I'm sure the Kyle McDonald's done a great job uh, developing players. If they see if they see something in Marks that wants them to get a to bring in him in with with a scholarship, which are which are very hard to come by. If they wouldn't got that, there's a reason why they're doing it. Matt, what, what do you think? I, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have a whole lot to add. I think the, the key point to emphasize is just that in the Big Ten, the rugged style of play, you can't lean on one running back the way USC did with Travis Dye in 2022, Marshawn Lloyd 2023. You need to have more of a rotation. You know, we saw Darwin Barlow transfer out of the program to North Carolina. 
didn't get as many touches. I think in 2024, you do need to move a little bit more toward running back by committee, a little less over-reliance on, uh, uh, on one guy. But of course, the bigger thing is the offensive line has to be better than it was last year. You know, if the offensive line is not better than it was last year, there's the, the ceiling for that running game is going to be lower. Sorry about that. Uh, Keith, uh, I think we lost Keith, um, but I hope your wife gives you a break so you can come in and call more often. Great question. And I again, I, I do think that uh, that young running back room will make its mark on this season. Slap Happy coming in with the $5 uh, uh, super sticker. As always, Slap, you're always a huge supporter of the show. Thank you so much for being here, even though you were late, but fashionably late, as you always say. So I uh, appreciate you being here. Also, while I got all you guys' attention, if you guys could, I've been trying to behave myself and not really go into it, but we can really appreciate you guys hitting that like button so more people can see the show. Also, another big thing is a, uh, Matt and I are really trying to get this channel to 5,000 um, subscribers. So if you would just take one second, if you're not subscribed, to hit that subscribe button. means the world to us. Thank you guys all for being here tonight. Um, it's, it's one of my highlights of the week coming in on Friday and be able to talk to you guys. So speaking of that... Um, Caller, hello. You're on with Matt and Tim. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? All right. This is Uncle Boom. I'm from Northern California in the Bay Area. I know that name, Uncle Boom. How you doing? Doing good. Man. Doing good, guys. How are you guys? Doing excellent. What's on your mind tonight? Great, great. So I've got like about a two, two, it's a two part question. So one, I, Matt actually uh, hit on um, Darwin Barlow about 30, 30 to 45 seconds ago. But what was the deal with him not being utilized the way he should have been? I mean, I understand who we had, Marshawn Lloyd and Austin Jones, but it felt like Darwin Barlow was probably a better runner than Austin Jones was. Um, and then two, how do you guys feel and see our new defensive coaching staff uh, going up against you know, the likes of a Michigan defensive coaching staff, Ohio State defensive coaching staff, uh, Minnesota, Iowa. Uh, that's, so that's my question. Do you mean going up against them in recruiting, or do you mean uh, our defense going against their offense? Well, recruiting, recruiting and Measure up. You know, scheming for, yeah, we're scheming for the offenses in the Big Ten. Matt, you want to take, well, you want to hit that first I'm one? I am sold on this defensive staff and I'm sold on, I guess I need to explain why I'm sold on this defensive staff. I mean, part of it is what Danton Lynn did at UCLA in one year. Like he didn't have elite studs, you know, I mean, he had a few really good players, but like this was, it was not an all-star roster that he inherited at UCLA under Chip Kelly. And he whipped that group into shape in one year. So that gives me confidence there. But the other thing is Matt Entz, national champion, uh, head coach at the FCS level, Doug Belk. He's been a, a a defensive coordinator the past few years at Houston. I mean, all of these guys have elite credentials. Like these guys, their their positions are higher than what you'd ever expect. You know, in terms of like you know a defensive coordinator willing to take a demotion to be a secondary coach, an FCS champion head coach being willing to become linebacker coach you that is those are not common moves like so it's not just the quality of the guys but the experiences that they have uh under them uh in recent seasons like th these guys have seen so much and they've achieved so much that you put them all together and and, and just to kind of circle back with alex grinch and tackett curtis both being at wisconsin you know that reinforces it brings back the memory that like alex grinch fell in love with tackett curtis and he probably should have been he should not have played as much as he did and alex grinch not be, beyond not coaching well in terms of scheme and technique and player development he also didn't put the right guys on the field consistently and i think that one of the things with lincoln riley it's not just a danton lynn thing at coordinator but it's danton lynn with Entz, with belk with taylor mays you have all those guys in the room i think they're going to be collaborating on decisions it's not just going to run through one guy 
And you know, Lincoln Riley, by handing the keys to Alex Grinch, was just a disastrous decision, not just because Grinch wasn't very good, but also because Grinch had too much authority. He had too much say so uh, about who played, who didn't. I think you're going to see these defensive coaches collaborating. Like that's why Matt Entz is a defensive assistant to Danton Lynn. Danton Lynn is much younger than Matt Entz is. You're going to have Entz and Lynn kind of as a, a sounding board type relationship with Doug Belk and Taylor Mays also being involved. You get those four guys collaborating. I think you're going to see far fewer errors, not just in terms of scheme, but even more centrally in terms of the, the right players are going to be playing and, and like quality is going to be rewarded and mistakes are going to be punished. There's going to be the accountability we didn't have with Alex Grinch. So that is why, like I, I keep saying, I'm sold on this staff. I owed all of you an explanation. That's my explanation. Yeah, and, and remember, so your your other part of that question is is Jesse Minter is most likely gone, right? We talked about earlier in the show. He's probably going to follow Jim Harbaugh to the to the Los Angeles Chargers, um, and who knows what that next staff's going to be like? You like we know you bring in a new DC, he's going to bring in his own guys. So I don't know what's going Michigan's going to look like, um, to be honest with you. Uh, but that we know that Mason Graham most likely be back there, and Will Will Johnson. You know that's a pretty good. So you got a nice cornerstone on the on the line. And you got a lockdown corner. It's about as good as anybody. If they can hold on to them, if the new staff could hold on to them, they should be fine. Jim Knowles and, and the Buckeyes had one of the one of the best off uh, defenses in the country statistically last year. So, um, you know, I would imagine they would keep up a little more uh, with the additions. So, <laughs> with the additions that they have, you know, adding to the secondary, I forgot. Uh, I'm blanking it on on the safety from Alabama. Um, they they they're they're beefing up, and so they're. They're going to be nasty. And then you, you left out Oregon. I mean, as much as I hate to say it, I'm not a Josh Gupoy fan, but they have so much talent now on that team. You know, even the freaking Quack. quacks are going to be good. So um, I, I have every bit of faith like Matt does in this new se- this new uh, defensive staff. I think, like we talked about, Danton was able to do it really quickly, turn that around at UCLA with a one great player and some pretty good players and a bunch of guys. Uh, I think the talent here at USC, uh, we don't have a Leatu Latu on our team, but we do have, you know, we do have a Bear, Bear Alexander and whoever we could bring in from the spring, plus a ton of young guys coming in. I mean, I'm really excited to see, you know, Elijah Hughes take that next step. What can Fountain do in his freshman year? That, you know, that's something that we we haven't seen yet. Who knows? Can Lucas turn it around? I mean, there's there's a lot of things to look forward to on this team that we haven't seen yet talent-wise. Because I think it was really dysfunctional last year. So th- th- those are things that we can think about. And then going back to Barlow, you brought um, uh, Barlow. A lot of these personnel decisions that U- USC has made, we don't get to see pra- – none of us get to see practice. Maybe these coaches uh, see something we don't. But Kyle McDonald about, is about as good as they get as far as running back coaches. I'm concerned. He he develops guys. Um, he's got a good eye for for uh, getting that talent and evaluating talent and bringing it in. So – I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna take his um, his evaluation of the situation, but I'm with you. I mean, the way whenever we saw Darwin get in the game, he, you know he could break the run. He had good vision. You know, it was like one cut, bam, he's gone. And good luck if you're in the secondary, you want to stop that guy. Uh, I'm with you, Uncle Boom. I got no idea why he didn't see more time on the field. Anything else? Thanks, for us? guys. Appreciate it. You good? No, that's it. Well, awesome questions. Thank you so much for calling in. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. All right. Fight on. Fight on. All right, Matt. We got another call in the call queue. I thought we were getting out of here on time. <laughs> we got a couple lining up here. Um, there was one thing I want to talk about as well, but we'll, we'll take this next call really quick. Good evening, caller. Thank you so much for watching, and definitely even more. Thank you for calling in. You're on with Matt and Tim. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? I'm Matt. What's going on? This is John from Detroit. What's happening, guys? Good to hear from you, John. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You just brought up Lucas. Uh, have we heard anything on him? I mean, because last year they had this kid to lose weight. Now, he's got the kind of frame he can put on weight, right? I don't know. I I thought I heard. So I think the amount of weight he actually lost was overstated, Matt. Do you remember that? I remember there was this... Conversation going around. I don't know what his playing weight was at Texas A and M, and then what he actually played at when he was at SC. But there was always that rumor going back to the Oklahoma days that they were trimming down linemen. So I, it wouldn't surprise me. 
I, and and the wow. second the second part wow. of the question is um I I don't know how much weight he could put on that frame, but I, I would assume that you think he want to play Friar Robert Dick at least two eighty five, right? Yeah, okay, okay. That that I mean that would be good. Now where do we have him projected at playing though? Could we? I mean, you know, because I think what I read when we first got him, we could play him on the inside or on the outside. And, um, you know, then when I heard that basically they had trimmed some of the weight off her, I was like, wait a minute, what's this all about? Again, I, that was just weird. The whole, the whole scheme, everything was just weird. And, and um, you know, what I, I'm with you guys. I, I do, I got, I got faith in the coaching staff and I'm actually, actually really, really excited about the coming year. Um, because I just think, you know, this is the third year. We got to keep remembering that. We're in the third year of a rebuild, okay? I mean, I mean, we don't want to say rebuild at USC, but that's the truth. That's what it is. Now, the first year kind of surprised us, um, you know. And, of course, last year we thought we was going to make even a, a bigger jump because of the quarterback. Um, but um, this year is an important year. Um, just, um, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I just – the skies can be the limit. And, and, and for most of the people are saying that basically with us, they know that often is we're going to be fine, but they just want to take a wait and see and see exactly what, the, what, uh, what the defense is going to do, you know, and I'm, I'm like you, Tim, I, I stuck, uh, I was talking a lot last year. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm right. going to be quiet. Going to slow it down this time. I'm yeah. I think that's a good call for both of us. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm gonna really, 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 really uh, slow it down. But listen, man, that's all I had, man. Uh, uh, great show. I was glad that I was able to get in here at the last uh, part of the show. But uh, man, you guys uh, are really, really, really doing a great job. And um, uh, but yeah, being here in Michigan, I have been hearing pretty much that Jesse Mentor is probably going to go with. Um, it's probably going to go with Jim Harbaugh. That's probably what's going happen and i've never seen a uh uh it's kind of strange you losing your coach and then people here are kind of like well you know eh. they say he's a great coach and all this type of stuff but he what he did was he delivered he delivered he delivered he he delivered a championship and that's what they wanted so leaving at this time i mean they, they figured they knew they couldn't keep him because they know he's always he's always just always chopping at the bits to get back to the NFL. And that's exactly what he did. But um, I don't know who they're going to bring in next, but it's just kind of, you know, every year people are, some of them are really not, the people, a lot of not, a lot of people are not really upset, you know? And I mean, I get it. I get it. I get it. But he did, he delivered for him. He delivered for him. It's been 19 years uh, since we won something. Uh, we, we, we got to, we got to get it together. We got to get it together, fellas. We got to get it together. That's all I got tonight, though. Man. Great show. Great show. Right. Though. Th thanks, John. Yeah, it I, has been a long time for USC. It's been a longer time for for Michigan. I mean, they were. I, I, my favorite joke was is that they had one national championship in my mom's lifetime, and she's like seventy five years old. So, I mean, the, the 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 idea now that they've won one far more recently, obviously, than we have, is a bit painful. But. Um, John Harbaugh is just like, I remember a couple of years ago, I was, my dad and I were talking about the fact that certain coaches are NFL coaches and they're going to go back to the NFL. And you you knew that Jim Harbaugh, uh, he was sitting down and looking over at John's, you know, Super Bowl ring, you know, and we saying, oh, man, I want one of those, you know, just like we knew with Pete. Pete was always, we just knew it was a matter of time before Pete went to the NFL because these guys, they come and they, and they, and they get a national championship at college level. They start looking back and saying, okay, you know, you guys kind of ran me out of the NFL. Now I'm coming back and I'm going to prove you guys wrong. And those type A personalities are the kind of guys that, that are going to go do that. Well, Matt, I think we, uh, I think we have we one more call. No, I, I think we're, we had one, but they're, uh, they, they've, they've taken, I'm very proud of the fact that I've been, again, the average call tonight waited six minutes. So I brought that down from, from 22 minutes before last time, uh, all the way down to six minutes. We got one more call, you guys. So we're gonna take one more call, yep. and uh, after this, from, from good. Twenty-two minutes. Oh, uh, caller, could you turn your radio down, or or your, sorry, radio down, your your TV down in the background? Um, what's your name? Where are you calling from? 
Hello. Hello. Hi. Will. What's up? Oh, Will, how you doing? Will from Virginia. Will ND. How are you doing tonight? Good. Good. I came with the USC question. So <laughs> I know this is far around the future, but I've been following recruiting pretty closely lately. And uh, I know um, Juju went up to 2025. So, and uh, ND brought a guy over for junior day, even though he's only a sophomore, Brady Smigel from Newberry Park out in Cali. And I know SC is on him too. Are you guys like, have you guys heard much like about getting him? Cause he's pretty highly ranked up there in the rankings. Thanks guys. He's in the 2025 class. Will no, I, I will be first of all, admit I'm not, um, I, I am not up on recruiting. Like I used to be, I'm getting back to it, but, um, you're saying that you're saying there's a, there's a guy, who, who USC and Notre Dame are recruiting this a 2025 quarterback? Is that right? Will? Will said 2026 in the chat. Oh, 2026. Um, uh, I don't. To be honest with you, I, I do not know. of. Uh, I'm, I'm not up to speed. I would definitely not be the first source for 2026 quarterbacks. Um, I do know that the tw only 2026 quarterback that we were looking at for a long time was was uh, Julian Lewis, as you said though, who's reclassified. Um, I do not know uh, who that what that name would be. Matt, are you familiar with that the quarterback? Can't say that I am, but um, you know, uh, like you know, I I'm worried about the 2024 quarterback room and how uh, Miller Moss and Jaden Maiava get along, how that dynamic works out. I think it's worth saying that. You know, I, I would personally give Miller Moss the keys to the offense for the LSU opener. I think he's earned that much. I think you, you saw how much the players trust him. That's really hard to turn away from. I mean, like maybe Mayava is slightly better in spring ball. Let's say that happens. I don't think that's enough to deny Miller Moss the opportunity to start for this team in game one. But here's the plot twist. I think that working Mayava into a game for a drive here, a series there, like that could certainly be an option. Uh, so like, like you're giving him meaningful playing time, not just garbage time, mop up duty. That should be looked into. But I do think you need to say Miller Moss is the starter in game one against LSU uh, because he's earned it. I, I would I would expect that as well. Only for a simple fact that also he, he just knows his offense so well. I'm not sure. Even let's just say that there's a – well, there's going to be a competition in the spring, and it's it's even – it's almost like you got to knock out the champ, and, and right now Miller Moss is the champ. And and, and unless um, Maeva comes in and just lights the world on fire, I believe you're right. We're going to see him start in Las Vegas um, uh, against LSU. Very very well at the beginning of the season. Jim, so you got you wrap up, yeah. Before you wrap up with some final notes, I want to just mention a few very quick things. One, go Lions because if the Lions make the Super Bowl. First, it means Alan Ross St. Brown it makes the Super Bowl. Two, the USC 49ers are injured. Talanoa Hufanga, Drake Jackson, like they're not playing. So like it just makes it easier to root for the Lions. But then the third point, if Aiden Hutchinson makes the Super Bowl, that's a huge recruiting tool for Sean Nua, getting a beast uh, at pass rusher, perhaps in the spring portal window. So several reasons for USC fans uh, to root for the Lions. Other note, we haven't seen LSU make huge splashes in the transfer portal. So like that's something just to keep in mind in the background and hopefully USC is going to outdo LSU in the portal in the spring. Right now, I, I, I'm quietly confident about how LSU or how USC matches up uh, with LSU uh, in Las Vegas. And third, lots of baseball talk in the chat. And I remind you that Tim Prangley is our unofficial USC baseball correspondent at Trojans Wire. He's going to be all on top of the diamond uh, at Dado Field uh, during the season. Now, Dado won't be at Dado this year, but yes, I will be there. Or uh, new I, venue. I, new venue. Yeah, they're, they're in the midst of breaking down uh, uh, Dado Field as we speak, probably. So, so where uh, are they the, playing? I that I, I want to find that out. I keep every week. I write ah, down a note. Okay. So I'm I'm going to check out where where they will be playing. Um, and also, uh, speaking of uh, NFL and our current coaching connections, Eric Henderson coached the Defensive Rookie of the Year uh, 
uh, this year for the Rams. Kobe Turner was uh, named uh, the AP Defensive Rookie Player of the Year. So uh, there's another feather in the cap for an already uh, well-liked and well-known coaching staff uh, addition that we got with uh, Eric Henderson. So we could add that one in there. Yeah, I got a bunch of notes I was going to get to, but we, we got some really good calls tonight. Again, as always, thank you so much, Manjeet, Gary, Avery, Augie, Dave, Keith, John, Uncle Boom, um, and we'll end at the end there. Sorry if I, if I missed your name. I, I, I apologize. I just looking off my quick little chicken scratch. But you guys uh, were awesome tonight. Thank you so much for making every Friday night your place to be for USC football. Uh, you guys make this show go. We really appreciate you uh, coming. Make sure that every Monday, you know, you can find us, uh, Mark, Matt, and myself. Monday, we have the Trojan Conquest live. Um, if you haven't already done so, I'm just going to hit you up one more time. Please hit that subscribe button. Uh, it's it's just the, the best way to let us know that and, and the like. Uh, it costs you nothing. really helps to support the channel. And uh, it's been a goal of ours to get to 5,000. But we, we appreciate everyone, as always, spending your Friday with us. We are not the last, but we are the first USC caller-driven call-in show where the call is literally yours. Uh, make sure you stop by here next week at 6 p.m. As always, we will be here. Make sure you're checking out Matt and myself, our articles in Trojans Wire. The links are in the description. Uh, you guys are the best fan bases. You guys are so many loyal listeners out there. Appreciate you guys, and we'll see everybody next week. All right Until next Friday at 6 p.m. Oh, no, until Monday at 8 p.m. Pacific for our show. Uh, it's Matt and me. Uh, fight on, everybody, and we'll see you guys sometime next. Oh, and give Reggie his damn trophy back. Fight on, everybody. You need to update that number, Tim. <laughs> oh, yeah, good point. <laughs>